Welcome to the Dr. Pete Goldman Show. This is uh, my most excited I've been for a guest, Barry Beck, a uh, former NHL player, captain of the New York Rangers for a long time. And uh, I think I had a poster of him on my wall when I was in high school. So that's the, I can't say that about any other guests that I interviewed. So welcome, Barry. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Nice to be here. Okay. So I'm I'm really excited to talk about the Rangers, but I don't I don't want to neglect your time in Colorado. So let me just start with that. When you got to Colorado, what was your um, experience? What were your impressions? How was it being a player under Don Cherry as a coach? What are some of your thoughts on your Colorado days? Yeah, well, I was I was just 19 when I was drafted, so I was just getting used to uh, the big American cities. And uh, so uh, Denver uh, being one of them. So it was a whole new experience for me. It was all new. I was excited uh, to go to all the new arenas, the so-called big six uh, that entered the NHL and Boston Garden, uh, the the Olympia in Detroit. Of course, Madison Square Garden uh, in New York and uh, many, many more. So that was a great experience for me when Don came. That was the beginning of my third year, and there was already a lot of problems with the team. There was a lot of talk of the team being moved to New Jersey. I'd been to New Jersey. I didn't want to go to New Jersey. I have a lot of friends in New Jersey. but understand. Listen, as a New Yorker, understandable. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of beautiful parts of New Jersey, but the Meadowlands uh, wasn't one of them. Um, so I was looking forward to playing with Don and him coming from Boston to Colorado. But there was just too many problems. I was trying to negotiate my contract at the time. I said I wouldn't go to New Jersey. And the Rangers just happened to be in town. And uh, I was traded and just basically moved my equipment from one dressing room to the other. When you were a rookie or even in your second, well, let's say a rookie on Colorado. And you went and you, you know, you were standing there, let's say for the national anthem, you know, playing defense. Um, and you looked across, who were some of the NHL players that you were on the ice with? And you were like, I can't believe I'm on the ice with, you know, Phil Esposito or who, or who you were, of course, you were teammates with later. But who who did you as a rookie look at or even check or interact with on the ice that you were very excited about? I think, well, you know, I played against a lot of the greatest players that ever played um, when they were at the tail end of their career. My first year, I played against Gordy Howe when he was in Hartford. I think he was 52 years old. I played against Bobby Hull when he was in Winnipeg. And, you know, when Montreal came into Colorado, when you looked over their blue line, you saw Larry Robinson and Guy Lapointe, Serge Savard. I mean, it was it was crazy. You know, I saw growing up and how powerful a team they were. But we did have an advantage playing in Colorado. It wasn't much, but it being a mile high, a lot of the teams got tired by the time the third period came around. Not tired enough, but uh, it did work to our advantage. And I really noticed that when I first went to Colorado and went to training camp, that that it was a mile high and it was hard to breathe. You know, I saw an interview once with Marcel Dion, and he said something like this. He said, even though he had a really good junior career, when he got, I think his first team was Detroit, if I'm not mistaken. He was very insecure, thinking, man, am I, can I even play in the NHL? And, of course, we know his career was spectacular. But he didn't know that yet. And he said he – I think he said he scored his first goal. And he called his father, I think, and he said, I think I can play in the NHL. So, obviously, he could, he could more than play in the NHL. But what I'm leading to is when – you know, you had a really great junior career – how long did it take you, or maybe it was your first game, how long did it take you to play in the NHL to say, no, I, I belong here. Not only do I belong here, but I'm going to be one of the better players. Well, I mean, uh, I think when I first came in and played my, my first exhibition game against Vancouver in Vancouver, uh, you know, I thought I belonged. I, you know, every time you, you move up in a different level, it becomes faster and stronger and you have to be prepared for that. And so I I had already prepared myself. I worked out a lot off ice when players weren't really doing that. So I thought I had a, I was a step ahead in everybody until, like I said, when I, 
when I went to Colorado and did go to training camp, I felt the mile high. And I know a lot of athletes like to train at high altitude uh, just because it, it makes them better and in better shape. So I got used to that and I got into a groove really quickly. I think the second game we played in Chicago, I scored my first game or first goal against Tony Esposito. And things just seemed to start clicking after that. A lot of people thought I didn't score many goals. And I scored 22 goals my first year. But my second year of junior hockey, I scored 19 goals and had 99 points, uh, the same as Brad Maxwell, my teammate. So I could play offensive. And, you know, I played many different sports, which I always tell kids, uh, play as many different sports as you can. Don't get just isolated into one sport because they can all help you. Did you ever consider being a forward? Because you you were, as you just referenced, you were a very successful scorer. Did you ever in junior or NHLs just even consider being a forward? Or you were just so entrenched as a defenseman, it didn't even cross your mind? Well, I was a forward really all my, in youth hockey until Pee Wee, and that's about 12 years old. My my first year at Pee Wee, I, I was on the third line. I didn't play much, although you usually play all the same. But I knew I wasn't going to win a trophy when it came to the end. So I started playing a little bit rougher. And by the end, of, at the awards banquet, I won most penalty minutes for the season. I brought, I brought home my trophy and my, my mother was so upset at me uh, for getting that trophy. She said to my dad, look what, what trophy your son has won. My dad looked at it, said most penalty minutes. Oh. Okay. He put my arm around me, took me down the hall, led me to my bedroom with the trophy. And he whispered in my ear, son, keep up the good work. So by then, Bobby Orr was, was of course, the defenseman that everybody wanted to be. So I tried to, and of course he was for me also, he was an idol of mine growing up. So I tried to incorporate parts of his game as far as being offensive. And what a great skater he was. So I, I worked on that. I really did a lot of ice off, a lot of ice off ice, excuse me, training to try and try and better myself. I did a lot of sprint work. As I said, players weren't really doing this, but I sort of could foresee and saw my first year at camp that the veterans came into camp and they most of them weren't in shape. Whereas I came in already in shape. And I think there's a completely different attitude with today's athlete. When you um, were playing on the Rangers, and there's, there's obviously, you know, we, you could talk to someone for three hours just about your Ranger experience, but I just want to highlight some of the points. When the rain, you know, in the early 80s, the Ranger Islander rivalry was phenomenal. In fact, it probably still is. But what I mean, it, it you know, being at the Garden, I'm probably being at the Coliseum too. Um, but being at the Garden for a Ranger Islander game was more intense than many playoff games around the league, even in a regular season game, and especially a Ranger Islander playoff game. What, what, what was it like just playing in those games? I'm, I'm thinking it must have been a phenomenal experience. Yeah, it's just a, a big adrenaline rush. I mean, first of all, I didn't really understand a lot about New York when I was first traded there and how how much the people love their sports teams. I mean, they live in there and die with their sports, which is the same in Boston and Philadelphia, those East coast teams, there's a different mentality. So of course the Ranger Islander rivalry really came about when the Islanders entered the league and they didn't have a very strong team, but they became stronger very fast. And then, uh, you know, they were actually favored to win in that 79 series where the Rangers beat them and went on to the finals against Montreal. But I think that's where it really all started to happen uh, with the rivalry. And, yeah, I mean, they had such a powerful team in the early 80s. And at that time, there was no free agency. So they were blessed with being able to keep those players. I mean, a lot of them Hall of Famers um, with that dynasty throughout the early 80s. Until so they, 84. Yeah, so they, they, won the, they won the Cup in 80, 81, 82, and 83. All years you, you played against them. Um, what was, I'll give you my thoughts and see what you think about them, but what was missing? What were the Rangers missing to essentially beat them in the early eighties? And I think one of the things among others 
was not that the Rangers had bad goalies because the Rangers did have good goalies like Hanlon and I guess Mio might have been. I forgot if Mio was before your no Mio was there when you were there and some other good ones. But before Richter came on later, I feel like the Rangers didn't have a goalie of the quality of like a Billy Smith or a Chico Resch. I'm not blaming it all on the goaltenders. Of course, there's a whole team to consider. But do you think that was one of the issues? Well, well, at that time, nobody had a goalie like Billy Smith. Good point. And how, and how he was performing in the playoffs. I mean, really, he was a, a playoff goalie. And that's when he uh, uh, was playing his best all the time. I mean, all you have to do is look at the Hall of Famers that were on that Islander team. They had, had great star power. You know, they drafted Mike Bossy. I think Mike Bossy was number 16 overall, the same draft year as me. I went number two. He went number 16. So a lot of teams passed on a guy like that where, I mean, how many seasons did he score over 50 goals? So when you get players like that, Trottiers, the Gillies, the Putt Vans, I mean, you know, you can go down the whole list, the Tonellis. And, uh, you know, they had a tough team. They could play a number of different ways. Now, when Herb Brooks came to the Rangers, you know, he introduced a new style to us, which was really more European style of puck possession. Don't dump the puck in. If there's nothing to do with the blue line, throw the puck back, regroup, and try to attack with speed. So I think it shows you what a great coach Al Arbor was because he was able to combat that technique and many times throughout those years in the early age, I thought we had the second best team. And if we could have got past the Islanders, or in I think one case, I think, I don't know what year it was, uh, where Pittsburgh had a short series with them and were leading. 82, 82, I think. Yeah, and then they managed to come back and and win that game. They were down 3-1 in the third period. I, I, we I, was, I was listening on the radio. Yeah, we were listening to that game too. I was at a restaurant in the Upper East Side in Manhattan. And we thought, yeah, here we go. They're going to lose. And they come back and won that game. And, of course, we went on to play them, and and they defeated us. So, yeah, I have a lot of great memories, you know. You become friends with those players after after those years of wars, and, and they were like a war. I mean, that first round of the playoffs is so tough, and it still is, because you're trying to hurt each other. So it's can you play long enough to find a groove? and not get injured. And, uh, yeah, that way you can go deep into the playoffs. Let me ask you about Bossy, um, because you brought him up. Him as a forward, you as a defenseman, and you also mentioned, you know, trying to hurt people in the first round. Were you thinking, man, this guy is, I mean, he's not fragile, but he's, you know, he's not like a, he's not like a Nystrom, you know, tough, or, or even a Trottier tough. He was a little more fragile. Did you say to yourself, man, every time he's in my corner, I'm hitting him as hard as I can. Or was he too elusive, or how did that go down in your mind? Well, this is, you know, Herb Brooks used to have me on the ice when when Boss was on, um, you know, to try and combat his uh, offensive power. Yeah, you do want to play physical against those type of players, but with the Bossies, with the Gretzkys, they're pretty smart. They're not going to leave themselves along the boards, or if they cut across the middle, they're going to be watching. You won't see many hits on Mike Bossy or Wayne Gretzky or players of that caliber throughout their careers once or twice, and they'll never do it again. So yeah, he was a tough guy to hit. What I used to do was try to, what I used to do was try and just keep him to the outside to make it a little bit easier for the goalies, but he was used to that. He could pick the corners from the outside. He scored a lot of goals going down the right wing. He did. I remember that. You know, you mentioned before about your father and the penalty minutes. So I'm just going to say, this is not really a question. I'm just telling anyone who's going to watch this. You know, Barry, it was very impressive because there was a lot of guys who were just enforcers in the NHL, like a Dave Brown, who you fought a couple of times. Um, but Barry, I think, was as good as any fighter in the NHL. I mean, you could say that, you know, you were equal. You were, you were tied for number one with any fighter in the NHL, but you weren't really a fighter, which is pretty impressive to be a, a spectacular player, captain of a team, and it just happens. Hey, you're 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 not even a fighter, and you happen to be probably tied for the best fighter in the league. So that's just uh, wanted to mention that. But question about that: in all of these 
rivalry games with the Islanders. Correct me if I, correct me if I'm wrong. You never once fought Nystrom or Gillies. Am I right? Correct. So was that just a matter of just this high level of respect and there was just no need to do it? Or did it almost happen? Or how did that, what was the dynamic there? Well, I mean, I I don't consider myself to be, a, or didn't consider myself to be a dirty player at all. I thought I always wanted to be an honest player. I wanted to play tough. I wanted to play physical and to gain respect. And I tried to do that when I first came into the league. And players like Gillies, and Nystrom, I mean, if we were going to fight, we'd fight. And I think that, yeah, we did have a lot of respect for each other. I know I did for them. I, you'd have to talk to them. Of course, uh, Clark has passed on now. But, but um, yeah, I really look forward to those games because those were two players that I looked forward to playing because you had to be ready. You know they were going to be physical with you. So... I think that was always a challenge Did you, for, a guy, yeah. for a guy like me. And you never, just correct me if I'm wrong, you also never fought Lane or Howitt, or did you fight Howitt? Yeah, I think I fought Gary uh, one time early. And I think with Clark, I know that one time he tried to fight Terry Karkner when Terry Karkner was a rookie. I remember that. And, and I just came in and sort of, sort of dropped my gloves and grabbed him just, you know, for Terry. I mean, Terry ended up being a pretty good fighter. He did. But uh, when you first come into the league, you know, you got plenty of time to prove yourself. And I didn't think that that was the right time. In fact, there was a similar situation. I think you were on the Rangers already. I think Chris Contos was on the Rangers. He was like 19 and he fought Nystrom and that was a bad decision. I think you were in that game. Yeah, well, Chris is another guy. You know, I I think he set a record when he went to Tampa Bay. uh, where he scored five goals, I, w- I think it was in a playoff game because I know his name came up in this year's playoffs when Pavelski scored five goals and there was somebody else, um, but that had tied Chris's record for a for a playoff game. Yeah, I see a little bit of Chris on uh, on social media and yeah, it's great to follow the guys and see where they are because that's one thing you miss about the game is the camaraderie with the fellas. When you travel around with 20 guys, I mean, you have a lot of laughs. Yes, there are, there are, of course, ups and downs, but you try and do little things to combat the monotony of an 80-game schedule. Yeah, and I know you had a lot of good friends on the team that you're still friends with, as you just referenced. Let me ask you about uh, one guy who, you know, you notoriously didn't get along with, and let me just kind of set this up for the question. I know when Hospodar, Eddie Hospodar, got traded, whether he was on Minnesota or Philadelphia or wherever, I think he played for Hartford. I don't know where he was, but you guys, you were always seeming to be going after him. So my question is, when you were teammates on the Rangers, did you already say to yourself, I don't even like this guy, even though he's my teammate, or did you like him as a teammate? And then when he was not on the Rangers, he did whatever he did on the ice to get you upset. Yeah, exactly. The second, the second. Okay. The second. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I liked him when we were teammates. I mean, a lot of the opposition didn't like him and it was the same when he went to, to Philly and it was the same when he was in, in Hartford, you know, he liked to stir things up. That was his job and he was good at it. So yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think there was a f- few different times when, uh, when I tried to go after him for things that he had, he had done, but that's part of the game. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. One of the time you fought Dave Brown twice and Dave Brown, I guess, you know, with someone like maybe a Bob Probert or a Joe Koser, you know, Bob, Dave Brown was known as one of the better fighters ever in the NHL, but you did very well against them twice. And there's one fight. It was actually preceding a bench clearing brawl where you were in the corner and you landed on top of him. And I don't know what you were saying to him, but do you remember when you landed on top of him and he was yelling at you and you were talking to him? Do you remember that conversation? I do. <laughs> do you want me to see this? Yeah, I mean, was it, look, I mean, again, I, I yeah. you was want it, me hey, let me up so we can fight. I mean, what, what was that about? If you want me to repeat the conversation, you better go to commercial. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm from New York, so I can, I can take it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can read into it, what it, what, what uh, I don't think I have to repeat it word for word. 
you know, I just, I just told him I'm always going to be there. So whatever he wants to do, you know, he was a left-handed fighter. I mean, I'd like to early in my career, if you watch some, some clips, I like to throw with my left hand also. I mean, I yeah. could throw with, with both hands. Um, so that didn't matter to me. I think with a left-hander, you throw left hand. And I think guys that did well against Dave Brown usually did that. But yeah, he was a big, tall guy. He was, he played mean and that was his job and he was very good at it. Speaking of uh, tough guys you fought, and actually when I was listing a moment ago, the tougher guys, I left one out who was probably one of the best fighters of your era and you fought him, which was Ben Wilson. Um it, it looked, if I'm remembering that fight correctly, you know, the fight went on a little bit, but then you kind of held each other. I guess the refs got there. But what are your memories of the Ben Wilson fight? Because he was definitely a dangerous guy. I remember, you know, I remember that I was fighting with Paul Holmgren. I remember that. Yep. And so, and that would turn into a, a more of a wrestling match because everybody got into it. it was by our bench. So... I didn't really feel like fighting anybody else because I'd already fought one guy, but, and the way that things happened, there was another fight, I think with Eddie Johnstone and it came around where, where, um, where Paul and I sort of hooked up together and I was ready to go again. And then Ben jumped in. Ben was a big, strong guy. And I, you know, I was a little bit off balance in the beginning, or I should say that he put me off balance. And so I wasn't in a very good position. So when you're not and you're fighting on the ice, you only have a certain amount of time. So it's either you try and start swinging or maybe it's better that you might get another chance. And with me, I was already a little bit tired. I don't want to make any excuses. Uh, I never do. And yeah, probably wasn't my best go ever. But, you know, that, that was the way the get that particular game was. Philly, Philly wasn't liked by, by Ranger teams or by Ranger fans. You know, when we used to go into Philadelphia with Herb, Herb Brooks, Herb used to make us, you know, we'd take the bus down from Philly and Herb used to make us walk maybe three, four blocks away from the rink, from the spectrum. And there would be Philly fans. They'd be throwing rocks at us, be hiding behind fences and yelling at us. I mean, that walk turned into a jog every time. We finally got to the point where we told Herb, Hey, can we just take the bus underneath the spectrum instead of having to walk the three blocks and, and get any rocks thrown at us? When, so you know, and, by, and by the way, I just want to say about the, uh, even you said, you said your best go might not have been Ben Wilson, but really, even as a viewer, I could see all that. I could see, you know, first of all, you were playing a lot of minutes. You were, you know, having your thing with Holmgren. Wilson got in and you obviously were tired, but you didn't lose the fight. And even to draw with Ben Wilson when you're tired is, quite an accomplishment. But on that note, um, speaking of other guys who, you know, had your back and you probably were happy you were on your team, <clears throat> what was it like playing with Nick Fatio? I'm assuming that especially in those situations, it was real nice. To, in fact, Nick Fatio beat Ben Wilson pretty good, I think in 79 or something like that. What was it like having Nicky as a teammate? Yeah, well, when Nicky first game, I mean, not only was I happy, but the rest of the team was happy. You know, being from Staten Island, you know, he's a he's a real New Yorker. So the first game he came, he said to me, uh, Bubba, that's what was my nickname. He said to me, I'm going to throw some pucks. This was in a uh, warm up. I'm going to throw some pucks up to the crowd. Why don't you join me? So he started throwing them up into the blues. I mean, that was pretty far to be throwing pucks up. So I started throwing a couple and I threw my shoulder out after about the third one. So I went and I remember playing that first game. I was going, I, I could barely move my shoulder the whole game. So, you know, Nicky is a practical joker. So there's a lot of stories, and I have a lot of stories myself about Nick and what he used to do to players. I have a great story. It's a little bit long, but I'll tell it another time. But he was he was a practical joker on the team. He kept players loose. And, you know, he kept the other team honest. Yeah. Um, just, just some random, you know, just, just like I asked about Nikki, I just wanted to make an observation about another one of your teammates. And I think one of your really good friends, um, and just get your uh, thoughts. Cause as a viewer, I was, I always marveled at it. And that's about Ron Greshner, who I think is a really good friend of yours. 
Ron Greshner was the best freaking stick handler. It looked like he was stick handling in slow motion. He would just kind of go through a team's, um, you know, the, he'd go through the opponents with this very slow stick handling. Of course, sometimes he'd lose the buck. But how is he? I mean, was that also happening in practice? In practice, he's just going through guys with that kind of slow motion stick handling that's hard to stop? Hey, well, Ron was, and he is a good friend. Uh, he was very deceiving. And we we played in the same junior team. We both played in New Westminster. He was before me a couple of years, played with my brother in New Westminster. And I used to watch him then and really marvel at his puck control and, and what a good defenseman he was. You know, when he played 16 years, all for the New York Rangers. So, I mean, I hope they retire his sweater. I think he's the first player that when they talk about it, that, you know, when you play 16 years, and give your heart and soul to that team and to the city. And he's still there, does a lot of work for the Rangers. So, yeah, it's an honor to know him. And, yeah, I think we all marveled at him in, in, uh, in practice. You know, you know, when you play against guys in practice, a lot of them aren't practice players. I mean, a lot of guys are game players. You can see guys skating a 1,000 miles in practice, and they're the best practice players. And then they don't do anything in the game. So he was one who was sort of in between. You know, he could he could do it in practice and he could do it in the games, but he never looked like he was trying. Yeah. He just always, always had good body position and knew how to protect the puck. Back to the Herb Brooks era, which you already referenced. So, right, he's got the European style, not dump and chase. He gets guys on the team. Like, uh, I think it was like McClanahan and Pavlich and smaller, fast guys. Um, obviously, it worked to an extent, but it, it didn't lead to a Stanley Cup. So my question for you is, if you were the GM or you were the coach at that time, would you have said, this is a good plan, but we just need some bigger players? Or or was that not the issue? What was the it, what, Why didn't the Herb Brooks era end up with a cup? Well, that, Well, at that time... I don't think the bigger guys could play that style. And that was Herb style. That's what he played in university. That's what he played with, with uh, the gold medal team in Lake Placid. And I mean, you had to be talent, talented player. You know, when I first went to New York, Fred Shiro used to have 40, 45 minute practices and guys used to complain. When Herb came, you know, we had three hour practices and, and guys complained. So guys are going to complain. One way or another. What do you think? Let me just pause there. Let me just pause there for a second and just slightly off the topic. But what do you think? Of, I know I, I don't think you ever played for Mike Keenan, but what do you think about a coach like Mike Keenan who has these intense practices, who's super rough on players? He's he's uh, making it almost like these guys are like uh, Green Berets or Marines. Can you overdo that? Or is that really just making these guys so tough and so sharp? That that's a good idea, you know, which goes along with these long, torturous practices. Yeah, I think a coach just has to be who he is. Uh, I mean, Mike obviously won won the cup in in New York, and I mean, so he was blessed to be able to do that with Neil Smith, who was the GM. So you know, he had success there, but he also had the players to be able to do that. So yeah, I always respected coaches that treated you like a man. You know, they, you are a man. Guys have families. I mean, the thing with the coach is he's got to win or he doesn't have a job. And whatever it takes, I guess, for a coach to do, then then he's going to do that. They have Coaches have different styles, different personalities, and whatever fits that particular team, hopefully it works. Who, who are your favorite defense partners? I know you and Rayo Rusalainen were partners that seemed like a really good uh... – team a, a, a great duo on defense who are some of your favorite defense partners well when I was when I was in New York I mean I played with everybody so yeah it was it was pretty easy to play with rail because I just stayed back and just I just told him listen you go I'll find you with the puck don't worry so much about playing defense I'll stay back and so that's what I did when I played with him you know, I laughed. I talked to Tom Laidlaw recently. Tommy and I used to kill penalties quite a bit. And I used to like playing with him because 
I would tell him to stay back and then I would get a chance to go because he was more defensive, but he would never listen to me. He just wanted, he wanted to do the same thing. So I think we were both sort of in that category where we were, we were probably more defensive, but you know, we wanted with her, everybody had to play offense. You, you attacked with five players and that's what made the game fun. It just, you're always on the attack. As soon as you got the puck, you always thought offense, offense. Um, I know there's a a famous, uh, you know, obviously you know it and I know it. I don't know if everyone watching does, but there was a very famous, uh, you know, catchphrase from the Ranger announcer, Bill Chadwick, which of course was shoot the puck, Barry. Did you look at that like, hey, this is just annoying. Give me a break. I know when to shoot the puck. Or did you look at it like, man, maybe I should shoot more. Or did you look at it like, who cares? I'm doing what I'm doing. I mean, he's an announcer. He's going to say what he says. But how, how did you feel about that comment, which became very famous in New York? I think I think the latter, where, uh, you know, I didn't really care about it. I mean, I mean, it was, I thought it was an honor to be associated with Bill Chadwick. Um, you know, I had lunch with him one day, and he, he mentioned to me that he's been watching. He thought I should shoot the puck more. So that particular game, I just happened to, to shoot it a little more often and I happened to score. And so he would say that every time I, especially when I scored, he would, he would say that. And I didn't wake up in the middle of the night with cold sweats or anything. Thinking about, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I didn't uh, think so. You know, maybe I'd like to be remembered for something else, but Hey, it's nice to be remembered. Right. Good point. Um, while you were on the Rangers, they got a lot of players over the years through trades, players who at one time were 50 goal scorers or, you know, really good goal scorers. And when they came to the Rangers, you know, they weren't exactly over the hill, but um, they were a little after their heyday. I'm thinking of guys like Pierre LaRouche, I think Blaine Stoughton, um, some other, you know, guys who at one point were spectacular scorers and then and then came over. Um it was. I'm. I'm thinking it was pretty nice when you heard they got traded. Like, oh, we got Pierre Larouche, or we got these guys who can really put the puck in the net. Yeah. Well, with Pierre, I mean, Pierre and I were good friends. We were roommates on the road, and yeah, he was one of those guys like Bossy, where he didn't really have to look at the net uh, to score. I mean, he could shoot facing the other way, and he would know where the net was. So he was a natural goal scorer. Played with good, I mean, good centermen, especially in Montreal. But he scored 50 goals for Pittsburgh, scored 50 goals in Montreal. And he had 48 goals with us, with the Rangers. And I think it was two games to go in the season where he could try and get 50. And he would become the first player to score 50 goals with three different teams. And we tried to set him up. We did everything. He hit a couple of posts. Uh, but it wasn't to be. But. Yeah, he was a great goal scorer. Another one, as you mentioned, was Stoughton, and another one was Mike Rogers. At Mike Rogers. I, mean, I was thinking I, Mike Rogers was somewhere on the tip of my tongue. Thank you. Yes. Uh, they, they had both come from Hartford. So, yeah, they were great additions to our team, and it was o- offense that we needed. There was just some other parts that we maybe needed to, to really, uh, uh, I wouldn't say be equal with the Islanders, but have a chance to beat them because really you could beat most teams on every, any given night when the playoffs comes around, it's a little bit different. You know, so um, a- sorry. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, one of the lines that was made, you mentioned some of these players. I think there was a line that act, I think might've been Herb Brooks might've been the coach where he made a line with three centers. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I think there was the, it was the first line. I think it was, Rogers, Pavlich, and Duguay on a line together, but I think they were all centers in general. Am I right about that? Well, I think they might have played together. I'm not. I'm not too sure about Mike being on that line. I know uh, Pav uh, played with Duguay a lot, and Duguay played. You know, Ron was a highly regarded faceoff man. He was. I mean, he he was a he was a great faceoff guy. Whereas, uh, but he made Pav go into the corners all the time. So Pav would be the one getting the puck out to Ron. So I think Ron scored over 40 goals one year with Pav. So, and he was a force in the playoffs. 
So I don't think people really realize what a, what a great player Ron was, or for that matter, what a great player Pab was. Yeah, well, I, I definitely realize how great they both were. So speaking of Duguay on the faceoff, when you were home and you could make the second change and you were playing the Islanders, did the Ranger coach match him against Trottier, who was a great faceoff guy, or they or it just was? Yeah. I, I think in our, our zone, the defensive zone, they tried to have Ron out for as many faceoffs as possible, and then he would come off for a line change. Got it. Um, who was the uh, some of the tougher? We, we talked about Bossy already. Who are some of the toughest uh, players to defend against when you were playing defense? You're playing a team, and some forward is on the other team. You're like, man, I got to really pay attention. This guy is very tough to defend against. Well, I think Rick Middleton was one who played in Boston. Yep. Just because of his, you know, he was another one like Ron Greshner wasn't didn't have that all out speed and quickness, but had that deceiving playmaking ability and could also score. Uh, of course, Edmonton, the players they had in Edmonton with Gretzky and, and Curry, Curry being another right winger that came down my side with Messier. You know, as you mentioned, Marcel Dion earlier on, the first guy when I first broke in the league that I was really amazed was, uh, by was uh, Gilbert Perrault. Oh, yeah. Played, played, Buffalo. Played Buffalo. He was really the best puck handler that I ever saw and could skate just as fast. When you went to L.A., I know you took a little time off, I think, to heal your shoulder. I think you you had a little um, disagreement with Ted Sater, who was the coach for a while. But when you came back to L.A., what was that experience? First of all, you you wore a helmet. How, How did you go to the helmet in L.A.? Yeah, well, the three years I took for rehab on my shoulder, by the time I came back, I didn't feel like I was the same player. And the there wasn't many guys that weren't wearing helmets, so I thought, okay, let me let me try this. I never did feel right about wearing it, and I think, you know, I had asked them to be traded uh, near the trade deadline because they had come to me and told me that they weren't going to play play me very much through the rest of the season. I'd worked hard to try and come back. I wasn't the same player, but I thought I was working, working towards that. So I took my helmet off for the very last game. I think we played Winnipeg and I felt a lot better. So I sort of wish that maybe at the beginning of the year that I, that I wasn't wearing it. But like I said, the game was progressing. It was just a matter of time before everybody was going to be wearing helmets anyways. When you were playing on um, LA, obviously you were teammates with Gretzky. Nothing has to be said about Gretzky. I mean, it's obvious how amazing he was when you were, and but obviously you had played against him in games many times, but when you were just like in practice with this guy, were you like, my God, this guy's just incredible. Or did you see extra elements of his greatness being his teammate? Yeah, well, he was, you know, he made it fun in practice, especially for the defenseman. When we would do one-on-one drills and you would look and you see, you might have Gretz. The other defense would be saying, I got him this time. I got him. And, I, you know, you would say, no, 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 I got him. And he would be laughing when he come down on you because he knew the other or all the defensemen wanted to try and stop him. You know, a lot of our practices were open practices. Anybody could come and watch. And, you know, he wasn't the greatest practice player. It'd probably be hard for a lot of people to pick him out because he wasn't the kind of player where you watched him in practice where he where he stood out so much. Now, he worked hard in practice, but he always had a, this attitude of trying to make it better for the other players. And that's the kind of guy, guy he was. He was very unselfish, although at times selfish when he needed to be. That's why, what great players do. They know when, when, to, uh, when to be that way. And he was the one who called me uh, when I was thinking about coming back to play, uh, to come, come and try and play in L.A. And I thought the change would have done me good. I thought, you know, my time in New York when I was injured so much with my shoulder and my operations, my surgery. And I mean, I just thought I needed a breath of fresh air to to try and uh, to try and make that comeback. It didn't work it out. But, you know, I don't have any regrets, regrets for trying. When you played towards the end of your time in New York and your shoulder was bothering you. When you had a chance, or even I think you, if I'm remembering correctly, you actually had a fight with Tockett when I think your shoulder was not good. 
were you thinking like, man, I don't want to be fighting this guy or anybody because my, you know, I need my shoulder for grabbing and or punching or in the adrenaline, it didn't even occur to you. You're like, I'm fighting Rick Tockett. I'm fighting Rick Tockett. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Well, I never thought about not fighting. I mean, if you got to fight, you fight. I mean, a lot of times coaches told me not to fight, especially during the playoffs. If you did, you can break your hand or something, but I don't think you, you can look at it like that. You have to do what it takes for the team to win. So if that means fighting, that's what, that's what you do. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't a hundred percent then, but it didn't matter. I just wanted to play. I mean, I've been a hockey player for so long that you play through injuries and you're taught that from an early age, uh, you know, get up off the ice, continue to play. And that's why hockey players are so tough. They play injured all the time and through very bad injuries. You know, lots of blood, lots of stitches, of course, with skates and sticks and pucks that you're playing with. And so, yeah, it was, it was tough. You know, my, my time in New York, when, when I went through those in, injury problems with my seven shoulder separations, and I mean, that was very, very hard for me to have to retire at that point because of injury. No player wants to, to end their career like that. But for me, it was really, it was really hurting me. I mean, I was not, it was more, more mentally. It was, yes, it was physical, but really the mental part of it was, I was just so down and that's why I retired. I just needed to get away and try to rehab my shoulder. I mean, I was playing 10 games, getting hurt again, coming back, playing another 12 games, getting hurt again, another shit separation. It was difficult to go through. When you played on L.A., um, I think Jay Miller had got traded from Boston to L.A., and he, he was one of the tougher players in the NHL. He didn't lose much. He, he, he had an interesting fighting style, like your opinion. He, he, wasn't, he was like the exact opposite of like a Joe Kosher who was just like this. Miller seemed to just throw with both hands with these very short punches, and obviously he had a good jaw because he didn't get KO'd much or at all. Um, what what's your idea? What's your opinion of his fighting style, which obviously worked really well, and you were his teammate, so you probably saw a lot of him firsthand. Well, Jay, I mean, everybody will say the same thing about Jay, that he was just a great team guy, a great guy to have on your team. And yes, he did have those short little punches. That was that was his style to get in close, to brawl, and uh, he won a lot of fights that way. But he was more of a guy that would do anything for his team. So those kind of players, a lot of players respect because they'll do anything to play. And Jay's another, <laughs> excuse me, Jay's another, another funny guy. You know, he's, <clears throat> he's got that harsh New England accent, you know, which re reminded me of the sitcom Cheers all the time when, when, you would hear, when you would hear him talk. But yeah, a lot of guys loved him. How was it? I think you were you were teammates with Tanelli. Was Tanelli on LA then? Yes, John and so I what, actually. What, my I first ex, my first exhibition game, we were roommates, and you, he told me he told me he talks in his sleep, so I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. Did you reminisce? Did you guys have hours of reminiscing about Islander Ranger games that you played in yeah. against each other? We did. We talked about it quite a bit. And, and Kelly Rudy was also there. I, I used to uh, sit beside uh, Kelly Rudy. So, yeah, we had a lot of laughs talking about it. I was always telling him I was glad I could help win four cups, that, that they were good guys. I wouldn't want to do it again. But, yeah, you know, you, it's part of the game that you love is your interaction with other players be it if they came from other teams or not. That's that's what you joke about. you got to keep it loose all year long. It's a long year. Just switching gears a bit, and then I want to get to Hong Kong for a moment, but just switching gears a bit. Um, when it comes to being a high-performance athlete, obviously, you know, there's the physical aspect, which we touched on, and you were even doing some workouts that other players weren't doing, which you talked about earlier. But when it comes to the mental, for example, We'll just take an Islander Ranger game or an Islander Ranger playoff game or any big game. 
you know, if you get too high before, if you get too emotionally high with your adrenaline, by the time by the time the game starts, you might be a little low. But if you're too uh, too relaxed before a game, you might not ready to be prepared for it. So in all the years that you played, and you played in so many big games, the day of the game, the day before the game, a few hours before the game, what mindset did you have to keep your emotions balanced so they didn't get too high or too low and that you were ready when the game started? Well, I think, first of all, you try and be well rested. I mean, you try and get a good rest the night before. A lot of guys can't because they're thinking about that game. So during the day, you'll try and lay down. You know, you may have your game meal about 1230 in the afternoon. So you get time to digest your food. You're probably eating some complex carbs, something easy to digest. And, yeah, you once you have a little bit of experience of being in the playoffs, as I mentioned before, you try and find a groove. You know, that's why it's good to be playing every other night. You know, when teams win a series early and get time off, it probably hurts them more than helps them. Because, yeah, you like to be in that groove. You're playing on adrenaline. You're playing injured. So you almost get to the point where you don't care about the result of the game. Because if you're more worried about that, then you're not going to perform. You just go out and play. I like that. That's 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 probably good advice uh, for a lot of subjects in life. So that's really that's really helpful to anyone. Just getting to Hong Kong. How in the world did you end up in Hong Kong? How did that even develop? Well, I I'm I'm from Vancouver originally, and when I retired, I went back and lived in Vancouver. And I have some friends that played for the Vancouver police team, and they come over to Hong Kong every year, and we're playing in a hockey tournament. They came back. One of the cops called me. I I didn't think it was about coming to Hong Kong. I probably thought it was about something else. But he had mentioned to me that they had met someone in, in Hong Kong, and they wanted to start a hockey academy there that if I was interested and I grew up with a lot of Asian kids in Vancouver, but I'd I'd never been to the Orient at all. So I thought about it quite a bit and I thought I was very happy with what I was doing. And I thought I would look for somebody to maybe help them out. But through my corresponding with Hong Kong, um, you know, they had invited me over. So when I came to Hong Kong, it was, I think in 2007, in January, and it was about 27 degrees Celsius. So that was really the first winter that I ever spent where it was warm. And being being a little bit older, I sort of liked that idea of warm winters. So I really loved my time that I spent here. I still live here. And yeah, it's close to, it's a very convenient place to live. MTR system works great. You don't have to drive if you don't want to. It's a great place to travel from. I think with eight eight hours, you can reach half of the world. And it's also very close to Thailand, which I love to go to. I like the cultures of Southeast Asia. It's a lot different. It's more spiritual uh, than it is in the West. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy living here. How's your Cantonese? Mm, Susu. Okay. I don't don't... mean that means a little. You know, it's like one thing living in Hong Kong. I mean, I think anywhere where you go to a different country, it's out of the respect to the people that you learn the language. But in Hong Kong, you don't you don't need to learn Cantonese. You know, if you go to mainland China, like, for an example, Beijing, you would have to learn Mandarin. Mandarin, yeah. Mandarin is the official language of, of China. Hong Kong being a part of China. But in the South, more Cantonese is spoken. So it's all about tones. You know, I think there's seven or eight different tones in Cantonese. So, you know, a lot of times in, in the English language, there are words that, you know, there are silent letters and it's a little tough for, for people to, to understand. Uh, they have different meanings and that is the same with Cantonese. You have to be careful of your tones because you can change the meaning from a good word to a bad word. How often do you? How often are you in Canada or the U.S. Do you, to visit or, well, or anything? Well, I was back in September of last year, 
back to New York. And that's the last time. So, um, yeah, I just really, I love living in Southeast Asia. I mean, I spent a lot of my time in Canada <clears throat> and the U.S. And I think it was just time for, for a change for me. I love to travel. I like to meet new people. And I think that is that is great to be able to, if you're fortunate enough to be able to experience that, I think you grow as an individual. And I like to meet lots of different types of people. Excellent. Well, listen, Barry, I want to sincerely thank you. Um, I thought this was a great interview. I think anyone who watches it will really um, enjoy it and benefit. And um, sincerely thank you again.